this morning we're going to get back to work on our study of the book of Hebrews. And in this book, God wants to meet with us. As always, the Word of God is living and active. Hebrews makes that clear in Hebrews 4. And He wants to meet with you and I, and specifically, I'm looking forward to, and I hope you are looking forward to, the changes that God wants to bring in your life through the book of Hebrews. And it's a powerful book. We're not familiar with the author, some would say Apostle Paul, but it's not clear. But we do know this. In this book, God wants to meet with you, and He wants to meet with me. He wants to change you, and He wants to change me. And it's, it's a powerful book. And we finished chapter 1 last week, and there wasn't a single command in the whole chapter. That is, there wasn't anything in chapter 1 that says, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. The message was simply, God's Son showed up. He's greater than everyone. He's greater than everything. He's greater than angels. He's greater than men. He's greater than anybody because He truly is God in the flesh. He created it. He owns it. This isn't. This is creation, not the Creator. There is a God. His name and, and, and there's God and His Son Jesus, who's equal with God, showed up here, and He says, and He goes through this whole discourse of why He's so great, why Jesus is all that. Why he is the answer to our problems. And then we move into chapter 2 where we find ourselves this morning. And he says this in chapter 2, verse 1 of Hebrews. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For this reason, whenever you say it, it's, it's kind of like therefore, for this reason, looking back to chapter 1, right? Because in light of who Christ is, it would be insane to spend all your time, talent, and energy on you. To consume all your resources on you. That's totally insane if you understand who Jesus is and the point for which He made you. Throughout this book, the author of Hebrews is going to give some warnings. This is the first of five warning passages in this book. And the warning is this. He is coming to these Jewish believers... And he's saying there's a great deal of caution that you need. There's, a, there's this warning that you need to hear because they were in danger of sort of pushing Jesus out to the periphery of their lives. They were, they were under pressure. They were suffering for the name of Christ. There was a lot of pressure to turn away from Christ and to turn back to Judaism and to turn back to rules and regulations and religious activities, but to jettison Jesus, sort of push him out to the periphery and make him simply a part of their life but not the point of their life. And he said that's a great danger. And it's the same danger that we face. And maybe today, maybe this morning, maybe Jesus is a part of your life, but he's not the point of your life. Maybe in your own words you would see yourself in your life and maybe you describe yourself as lukewarm. But that's a dangerous thing. Since Jesus is a, if you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I want to spew you out of my mouth. And so there's a great deal of warning that we need as believers and a great deal of caution that we need, and Hebrews is going to deal with that. <clears throat> and in this, he says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And you, you sort of feel the angst of this teacher, and you, you feel like he's trying to get across. He's going, man, don't just zone out. Don't, don't be thinking on the Texans game later today. Don't be thinking on what you're going to do this week or how you're going to pay that bill. He says, don't zone out on this. He's like, you've got to get this. You've got to get this. Anybody who's ever taught the scriptures has felt this angst, this sort of, you want to communicate in a way that people go, wow, if that's true about God, then I need to do something with it. Because this is an information, it's transformation. And when it becomes mere information and not transformation, we become religious people. We become churchy people. We, we, we try to surround our lives with safety. We, we, we try to make our lives as comfortable as can be, and we, we might go to church and give 2%, and, and we might be like, oh, you know, I, I'm all about having a good family or, or whatever, but it's this safety little th life rather than this life that's presented in Scripture of what a follower of God, this radical life of following God is to look like when it's walking by faith, believing, taking God as word, believing these promises are absolutely true, and then acting based upon those as though this truly isn't eternity, eternities to come, that this is a brief, little, short while, and then all eternity, and we're actually not living for this time. We're living 
for that time. And that's the radical life, not the little church-going life, but the radical life of faith that God was, has called us to. And um, in this, this angst that he's feeling, it's, it's kind of like the stewardess, you get on a plane, and the stewardess gets up there, and is supposed to be giving you instruction about how to get out alive, right? And you don't give a rip, right? You're just like, oh, man, you get the magazine out, and you're flipping through that magazine with all those crazy gadgets to buy, and she's up there. The, your, your, your cushion is a flotation device, and here's how these things come down. And you're just like, oh, my goodness, you have get the iPod in. Nobody gives a rip about what the stewardess says, right? <laughs> and a lot of times... We're the same way. We wouldn't express it that way, but we're the same way. We pay about as much attention to God's Word as to the stewardess that we couldn't give a rip about. Because we either don't think we're going down, or we don't think if we did go down, you're thinking, what good would a floating cushion do if I actually crash in this mammoth plane, right? So you're just going, and the fact is, we either don't think we're going down, or we don't think it would help. But what God is saying is, in Hebrews, this is how you get out of life. And he says, it's important. It, you don't have to pay attention to the stewardess. You don't have to pay attention to your doctor or your dentist or whatever. But you better pay attention to what God's saying. It's that important. It's that important. And he says this. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word, verse 2, spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience receive the just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So what does he say we need to pay most, much more close attention to? It's Jesus and salvation. You go, at that point, people kind of check out. They go, I'm good, man. I got Jesus. Man, I got salvation. I can remember back when. I'm good. And so they check out and they start thinking on other things. And he's saying, no, no, no. You, it may, you may not be good. There may be a point you look and look back in your life and go, Jesus was all that. He was the point of your life. There was a passion. You were hungry for the Word of God. You loved to pray. You saw God answering your prayers. There may have been that point. And for all of us who got saved, there is that point we can say, I was, but God stepped in, and now I am. That Ephesians 2 transformation. But that may not be true today. That may not be true today. And what the author is saying that should send warning signals to say, if that's not true today, then there's something that's gone wrong. And we elbow Jesus out to the periphery of our lives, and he's become a part of our lives, not the point of our life. And something is tragically wrong. And there's a very large danger. And I'm going to reread verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels, remember, the Jews held angels in high regard, Unlike today, where we got touched by an angel or whatever we think of angels, they held angels in very high regard because they saw angels as that the deliverers of the law. For if the word spoken through angels proven unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience result receive the just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And so the Old Testament, the, the author is taking us back to the Old Testament, he's saying, wait a minute, get this. Go back and look at what happened to people who neglected the Old Testament. Because there's in the New Testament, we have something far greater. We've got Jesus. That was a shadow. This is a substance. That was a tutor to lead us to Christ, but now God showed up. And if that resulted in very destructive things happen, if we neglected God and His revealed will for our lives back in the Old Testament, how much more so in the New Testament, with far greater truth been given to us, will we suffer if we neglect and push Him out? These people weren't in danger of sort of walking away from church and not for, never picking up their Bibles again. We're talking about people who connected themselves in some way to God's people, and yet were in danger of going back to the rules and regulations as their sort of religion rather than a relationship of vibrancy and love and passion for Christ. And so I want to take you back for just a minute, since he takes us back to the Old Testament, I want to take you back to the law in Deuteronomy 6. He says this, Deuteronomy, we're just going to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. You can just listen or you can turn there if you'd like. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9 says this, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments with the, which the Lord our God has commanded me to teach you, 
that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. So this is going good. He says, may you listen to me. This is going to go really good for you. It's really going to go well for you, he's saying. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The great cry of the Jews, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. In other words, don't push him out to the periphery. On the point of your life, that's why you exist, is to worship me with your whole being. These words which I command, which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You get the idea that we are permeated with the truth of God, and we are to teach them constantly to our kids. You shall bind them as signs on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So the author of Hebrews is saying, you remember that when God spoke? And he expected us to listen, and he expected us to do something, and it was going to go really well for God's people if they would listen to him. And it was going to turn out very poorly for them if they didn't. He says, well, God's spoken. And in his final word is Jesus. He needs no other word. That is, in Hebrews we saw there's two times in human history, there's two portions, there's the Old Testament, where God was speaking through the prophets, through the fathers, and then his final word was Jesus. There's not a third phase to this deal. It's this, Jesus is God's megaphone to you, to me. And he wants us, and he expects us, and he demands that we listen to Jesus, that we pay much closer attention to Jesus and the salvation that he brings. And so, for those who draw near to Jesus, there are immeasurable blessings. That isn't to say, as in our day so many say, that, that this is a prosperity gospel thing. In other words, if you get Jesus, you'll also get good health, a Lexus, and you won't skip any pay raises. That's garbage. That's garbage. Um, Philippians 1, the last verse in that chapter says, It's been granted to you not only to believe, but to suffer for my name's sake. When Jesus had some... Uh, scribes come to him in Matthew 8 20 and they say we want to follow you Jesus Jesus says really you want to follow me he says foxes have holes and birds have nests I don't even have a home to lay my head I don't have a pillow to lay my head on I'm homeless you really want to follow me are you sure about that in fact elsewhere in Luke 9 23 24 he says if you want to follow me you must deny yourself take up your cross daily and come follow me. The life of following Christ isn't the life that everything is going to go well for you monetarily. That your health is just going to be amazing. The doctor's going to look at you and you just go, wow, you are just a poster child for healthy people. No. In fact, if you make that the standard, Jesus was a complete failure. And every one of his close followers was as well. Not only did they suffer immensely, most of them died brutally. Not just Jesus, but 11 of the 12 disciples died a martyr's death. And the only one who didn't wasn't exactly camped out in Bermuda. He was like, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos until he died, where he wrote Revelation from. This wasn't, he's not calling out to a people to say, come follow me and I'm going to give you a cushy life. What he's saying is, come follow me. And I'll forgive every sin that you've ever done against me. Past, present, future. I'll give you contentment. I'll give you purpose like you've never imagined. I'll give you power in your life so that you can come follow me and you can suffer for it. And it won't even bend your joy. Because I'm going to give you a life that you never imagined. And it's not the American dream. It's well beyond that. This is the real reality of joy, peace, contentment, purpose, power. That's what Jesus wants of his followers. And that's why the majority would not have them. Not only does he say, oh, you want to follow me? He says, well, there's all kinds of perks. Now he says, there's 
all kinds of suffering ahead. You sure you want to follow me? That's why when he preaches in Luke 8 and elsewhere, and he draws this massive crowd, he just keeps preaching until there's almost no one left. So then there's this few people left, and they go, and he says, are you sure you want to follow me as well? His calling is quite a bit different than come, have a safe, nice little family so that, you know, protect your kids, put sunblock on them, put helmets on, live in a gated communities, you know, eat healthy so you can live a really long life, always really be like, you know, this, and, and hopefully you'll die in a really soft bed, you know, one day, at a really old age, you have, you have a lot of little cute grandkids that are all obedient, it's a real safe life, you know, it's not it. It's a radical life of faith. This is leave everything and come follow me. Surrender everything and come take up your cross and come see what I'm about. And so you have this Old Testament and you have promises and they're not health and wealth promises. Well, in the Old Testament it was much more related to practical, tangible things than it is in the New Testament. But if you rejected that, it would go poorly for you. Today, let me tell you, if you reject Christ, if you elbow him out to the periphery of your life, it's going to go poorly for you. It's going to go poorly for you. Um, so why do we need to pay much more closer attention? Well, on the positive side, because Jesus is superior. He's superior to everything. He's superior to angels. He created us. He created this world. He sustains it. This didn't just happen. Um, we're not moving through the Milky Way galaxy at 43,000 miles an hour on accident. Uh, I love mechanics because I realize these things are a total pain. And uh, when you're working on them, you're smashing your knuckles and all this stuff, and you're just trying to repair something somebody else made, and you're going, God made all of this, and it works, like, all the time. Like, I can't even keep my cars working. I can't even build them. And you're going, this is a fabulous design. But this is the design, not the designer. This is a fabulous creation. This is the creation, not the creator. And so Jesus is saying, I'm him. I'm the creator. I'm the designer. I'm the God who gives you life. I'm the being who decides whether you take the next breath. I'm it. And so he says, pay close attention to me. Pay close attention. <coughs> and he says, I want to bless you. God designed us to live in fellowship with him and to love him and to be loved by him. And so there's hope, and there's healing, and there's wholeness, and that's what we need, isn't it? For us who squandered away all the time, talents, and energy God gave us, if you don't think so, look through the Ten Commandments. You and I have squandered what He gave us. How many of us have lied? Every one of us. How many of us have dishonored our parents? Or you just go through the Ten Commandments, you go, you and I are guilty. We squandered it. We took this life, and then we just used it on ourselves, and used so I have to use it up, and the whole time, God was saying, your life was given to you for my sake, for my glory. Come worship me. But God is seeking transgressors like us, wooing us back to himself, saying, I love you. I'm willing to forgive you. I'll clear the debt. I'll clear the slate with you. I'll accept you as a child, as a friend. I'll come into you. We can fellowship together. I'll take you to be with me. You can have eternal life. He's calling out to sinful, wretched people like us, saying, I still love you. I'm going to show the character of God is not like the character of man. He loves to give and he loves to forgive. So he's, he's calling us. He's wooing us. Well, too often, I, I, I wonder how many times our lives parallel Israel. If you go back to the Old Testament, it's easy to go, what a bunch of clowns. Are you kidding me? Right? If you go to the time of the judges, and you go back here, and, and this was the time before the kings, and you start watching the judges, and you see the people under the judge do really good, whether it's a fifth Othniel or Samuel or whatever judge, Deborah, you name it, and things go really well while they're following this particular leader that's loving God and they start worshiping God again, and they get strong, and they run their enemies out, and everything's going well. The judge dies, the people drift. Just like Hebrews said, drifting is something that just takes, it's, it's a nautical term. It's as though here is the port, and you just kind of drift by it slowly, quietly, and they just drifted away from God. Before long, they were so weak, they were overcome by all their enemies. They were just dominated, they were in prison. How many Christians have drifted by gospel and Christ as the point of their life and now he's just some part of their life 
And now they're dominated by sin they can't overcome. They're dominated by these emotions that they're tore up inside. They can't get a grip on why is everything so bad? Why is everything so difficult? Why am I suffering so greatly? And it's because they drifted by that. They drifted by it. And you know what? Every one of us needs to check our own hearts this morning. Have you drifted by what God intended for you? You need to refocus and realign your focus on Jesus and His salvation. Because we too become weak and dominated by many things and we can't overcome much in that state. On the negative side, he says if this the Old Testament proved unalterable, you couldn't change it, and every transgression and disobedience received, received a just penalty. This word just, you probably don't agree with God on this. You probably don't agree. He says, every transgression, I brought just penalty. And you and I look at that and go, that's justice? We don't really know justice. Listen to this, and I'll, I'll point out why I think you and I probably don't get God's... Um, we probably don't agree with God on this, but Numbers, i just give you one example, Numbers 15, listen to this. He, he says, I brought just punishment for people who disobey. Numbers 15, verse 30, says this. But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is naive or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and the person shall be cut off from among his people. Let's see. Verse 32, Now, while the sons of Israel were, on, were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath. So he's out picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Okay. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation, and they put him in custody because it had not been declared what should be done to him. So they bring him to Moses, stick him in custody. What should we do with him? He's picking up sticks on the Sabbath, right? Then the Lord said to Moses, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. See what I mean? You don't agree with God, do you? He says every violation had a just punishment. Really? Don't you sort of look at that and go, ouch, that's a little stiffer than I was thinking. Picking up sticks, circle around him, and then stone him to death. Wow. So we don't always agree with God, do we? We look at His Word and we go, ah, I'm not sure. But He's saying, His point to you and I is, not that we're going to circle around and stone anyone, but He's saying, it's not going to go better for us in the New Covenant under this far superior thing of grace. It's not going to go better for us if we push God out to the periphery and just sort of excuse and rationalize or say, no, it's no big deal. Can you imagine the guy picking up sticks? It's really no big deal. They were sticks. And God says, big deal, kill them. Right? You're going, what? And a lot of times we go, I am in the new covenant. There's a whole lot more grace. So I can take a whole lot more for granted. It's no big deal. I know Jesus. Really? Is that what he's saying? I'm not saying he's going to stone us. I'm saying that we need to get closer. We need to refocus in on Christ because... He's very vague about what this, what the difficulty in your life and my life will be if we lose focus of Jesus. But he doesn't have to be very specific. All that we have to know is it's not going to go well for us, is it? It's not going to go well for us when we're not loving God and we're drifting along and dealing with these consequences. So verse 3, the second part. After it was at first spoken to the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testified with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And so he says he testified to us through the Lord. Now Jesus is the most popular person who's ever lived. More books have been written about him. More songs have been sung about him. More governments have based their uh, based different philosophies or, or uh, different systems of government on, on things that Jesus said. More people have spent time studying and meditating on his words and teaching his words than of anybody who's ever lived. Even those who reject and deny and sort of want nothing to do with Jesus often use his name, right? They smash their finger and it's not George Washington, right? It's not that way. You know what I mean? Um, so Jesus is popular, 
even among people who hate him, right? Um, and so you go, what's so popular about Jesus? Well, there's something unique about him. He's God. The scriptures testify by him. And God gave us a testimony, his megaphone, his loudest voice that he has in mankind is Jesus. And so, not only is Jesus to be enough to get our attention to say, you need Him, He's the reason you exist, He's the reason that you live, He's the purpose for your life, but He gave us other testimonies as well. I had said that the apostles and many of the close followers of Jesus died in brutal deaths, and one thing you don't see is they come up to get their head chopped off, and they go, you know what? I was, I was kidding. I was totally joking. It was Jesus. <laughs> nice dude. I was joking about the whole God thing. Yeah, let me go. You know what I mean? They don't do that. In fact, they deal with it much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. They say, you know what? If you're going to take my life, you can have it. You can kill me. But ultimately, you can't stop me. I'm not backing up and I'm not backing down. I've met the Lord of the universe. He's God of creation, the Lord before time. And I only have one goal in mind. And that's to stand face to face with him and meet him and hear, good, well done, my good and faithful servant. So they stepped up and they died in brutal death. Some even undeservingly, church history tells us, said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like him. Crucify me upside down. And so they met their death with unbelievably gutsy, bold proclamations that he is, in fact, the risen, ruling Lord of the universe. He says, not only can you believe me, because he showed up and did sign after sign and miracle after miracle, his followers willingly died the most horrific deaths without ever uttering, no, I was kidding, let me go. But rather going, yep, I only have one goal in life, it's to meet the king. If it happens today, then I win. If it happens tomorrow, I still win. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, and I'm unstoppable. And that's the type of life, not the safety little not life that Christians have made it, it's a gutsy life. It's a life of radical faith. You go through the, the Bible and you go, in these last four verses, verse four says, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. And sometimes we read that and we see all this unbelievably cool stuff that's going on. And we wonder, why is my life so blah and their life so gutsy? Why do I simply go, as one preacher goes, why did Paul start riots everywhere he went? This is a preacher from England. And he says, and everywhere I go, they serve tea. A lot of times, we take this and we say, he says, by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we have to wonder. Maybe a bit of this is, is lost on us today. Maybe we each need to really do some introspective questioning and prayer in our own lives to say, is Jesus the point of my life, or is he merely a part of my life? Have I zoned out so that I've sort of just kind of drifted away? Jesus kind of, yeah, you know, Jesus, but he's we've lost focus on him? Because point your life into the book of Acts, and you start going... And then they stood boldly. And they went to this city and they proclaimed the gospel. And they got beaten and thrown out. And they got to the next city and they just proclaimed Jesus. And people say, that's just not popular to proclaim Jesus today. And it was very popular in Acts, right? They usually put them up in five-star hotels and fed them. Oh, thank you for telling me about Jesus. They got beaten, stoned. How many times did they have to smuggle Paul or others out because they wanted to kill him? It wasn't popular then either. So they just keep proclaiming and proclaiming and suffering and getting back up and proclaiming. Paul got stoned, drug out of town. The, his fellow believers come around and like, oh, he's dead. He gets back up and he walks right back into that town. But what do we have? Instead of, you know, if you plug your life into the book of Acts, you have, and they got gutsy and they went and proclaimed the gospel. And then we look at our own lives and we go, and I, by faith, you know, left that church because they sang three hymns and two choruses, and the chorus was like had four repeats, and I was so fed up, I moved to another church, and you go, really, is that, is that, doesn't that seem a little crazy, in light of Christ, you know, we need to ask ourselves, does our life look crazy, in other words, if your life were 
where chapter 5 of Acts, when people get to chapter 5 of Acts and go, oh, gee, that's a boring chapter. You know, these people by faith showed up to church on Sundays. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And then chapter 6, wow, or 7, and you know, Stephen gives a sermon, and he's such a great sermon, they kill him for it right after. You're like, wow, that's a pretty powerful, you know what I'm saying? My signs, wonders, and miracles. And so what we need to do is say, is Jesus in focus? Do we need to pay much closer attention than we're currently paying? Because are we seeing the hand of God? Are we seeing the majesty of God? Do we have that sort of all-out focus that says, yeah, I'm living an unstoppable life. There's one calling in my life, and it's to serve Jesus. And I get to meet him real soon. And I don't want to get there and go, you know what, Jesus? Man, I, I was able to keep my kids from being sunburned. I always kept a hat on them every time we went biking. We had the safest little life. And we were so cozy. And we made it through, Jesus. Is that really what? Is he going to go, well done. You, you even fed them organic carrots. Well done. Well done. Right? Now, I'm not saying go feed a monster drinks. We eat healthy. But the fact is, what are we doing in light of this Christ? Is it evident that we are living a radical life of faith? Or do we need to do some adjustments? And so I just close with this. Is Jesus the point of your life or a part of your life? Is he the point of your life or a part of your life? Is he in focus to such a degree that you can actually describe your pursuit of him, of him in the word and prayer as passionate? Or would pathetic be more descriptive? Would you describe as the deer pants for the water so my soul thirsts for you? Are you hungry to know him more deeply? Or are you pretty okay? with the level you know Him now? Are you broken for the lost around you to such a degree that you'll risk any relationship you have in order that they might hear of and be introduced to Christ? Or would you much rather not rock the boat and keep their friendship regardless of who they, whether they know Jesus or not? See, these are some important questions, aren't they? He's saying, we must pay much closer attention to what we heard. Let me pray for us. Father, we come this morning, and I know in this week I've had to repent. I've had to seek you. I've had to ask some probing questions in my own heart. It's easy to live a comfortable Christian life. It's easy to go through the motions. But, Lord, we don't want the comfortable life. We don't want sort of going through the religious motions. We don't want to elbow you out to the periphery. We don't want you as a part of our life. We want you as the point of our life. I pray right now that your spirit would move in our lives, convicting us of sin. If there's people here who never come to the point of seeing you as precious, as, as the treasure hidden in the field, as the scriptures point that for, for the love of you, they give up anything and everything to have you. I pray that if they've not experienced that, that they might even today, today would be the day of salvation and life before for all of us who have, Lord, may you just sort of prick our conscience and our heart right now that if in fact we've nudged you out of the primary position in our life, then bring repentance. Give us faith to believe. Give us a love and a passion for you. We want to go deeper with you. We want to live a radical life of faith. We want to heed this warning to pay much closer attention. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.